Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome to this event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. And as part of my role, I coordinate the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. This webinar is one in a series, which is part of the United Church's continued journey towards becoming an anti-racist church. Uh, and it's one of a series of webinars, and each is meant to be a time of learning, reflection, and action. Today's live event is now focused on an Indigenous-led framework for reparations and healing. And it features two staff from the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit, Joni Shawana and Sarah Stratton and we will be able to hear from them shortly. Um, this gathering time will feature a key update about the most recent national gathering from the Office of the Independent Interlocular for Missing Children and Unmarked Graves and Burial Sites, which has led out an Indigenous-led framework for reparations. And we will also have an update on the United Church's work on bringing the children home, as well as conversation about the various funds available through healing programs, how to access grants and bursaries, and how gifts from the National United Church Women support the Healing Fund. So all of that is coming shortly. This week, uh, the particular focus is around Indigenous justice, and there are a number of, of uh, written reflections, one by Lori Ransom and one by Susie McPherson Durende, which are available on the website. Uh, there are also some featured books, so we'll talk about the books uh, shortly. There are a number of books uh, that are available throughout the whole series of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, and here is the full collection of books here. This week in particular, we are lifting up two books. <clears throat> one is North of Nowhere, which is written by Marie Wilson, one of the commissioners for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it feels fitting to be lifting up this book this week, uh, particularly many of us are, are um, have been deeply saddened uh, by the passing of Marie St. Clair, who was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So um, Marie Wilson's book is one that we can pick up this week and remember. Another book uh, that we are featuring this week is Motorcycles in Sweetgrass. These books and more are all available from the United Church Bookstore. And if you were to order two or more books and use the discount code 40 days, you would be eligible for a discount of uh, up to 15, 15%. A few more things about today uh, as we gather. There is a newsletter that is available for the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, each week, there are a number of uh, updates that are available. Uh, you're welcome to sign up if you would like to keep up to date about this, but as well as general work around anti-racism. Uh, as well for today, uh, the, the, the chat is closed for today, um, but if you do have some questions, please feel free to email anti-racism at united-church.ca. Uh, we will. You're welcome to email questions at any time, and we will feed those to the uh, the two presenters who will be speaking today. So please feel free to email questions, uh, and those will get relayed to the presenters. Before we move to hear from Sarah and Joni, um, let us pause for a moment of prayer. This is a prayer for those struggling with justice. It is written by Mitchell Anderson, who is ministry personnel based in Saskatoon, and who is Dene Soutile. So let us pray together. You're welcome to join with the words that are on your screen. God, you listen to your people when we are in need. Receive us when we are tired and grant us rest. Accept us when times are harsh, as you accepted Hagar. Rescue us as you did your people from Egypt. Help us by your great power to continue in our struggles for justice, the same power that raised Jesus from death at work in our bodies, raising us out from frustration and weariness to proclaim your name and to live your justice. Be with us in our refusals to be worn out, in acts of joyful resistance, in everyday commitments to our own well-being and the good of our communities. Help us to experience the fullness of life and to share that life with all in the world. Through Jesus Christ, who endured struggle and pain to make us and the whole world 
the, the, the world whole and who rises to new life and who will raise us all to the new creation. Amen. So we give thanks for those prayerful words from Michelle Anderson. So with that, we move into our conversation about an Indigenous-led framework for reparations and healing. And first, we invite Joni to share her words of wisdom with us. So thank you, and over to you, Joni. Hello, good evening. I'm Annie Bojo. Joni Dishna Klaus with Kwamakong Don Chaba. Um, I'm, my name is Joni. I said Joni Dishna Klaus. Um, that's that's uh, in Anishinaabe. Um, saying my name is Joni. We Kwamakong Don Chaba means I am from We Kwamakong. It's located on the east uh, side of Manitoulin Island, and that is um, my my home and where I currently reside. Um, thank you for inviting me this evening, and um, I'm here to share with you uh, some some of the programs and um, how the process of uh, the Healing Fund works. Um, and also talk about the uh, a little bit about the partnership and the gifts that's received through the UCW. So a little background on the Healing Fund. Um, it was established in 1994, and it's a grant that supports healing initiatives to Indigenous communities to address the ongoing impacts of residential school system. Uh, many of the communities named uh, the need for mending, restoring, and celebrating uh, the sense of loss um, of uh, the sense of loss, and uh, along with hope and rebuilding identity. Um, the healing um, program um, consists of volunteers from diverse communities across uh, the country, um, who determines the funding criteria and evaluates all the applications. Uh, support for the Healing Fund um, is, actually, is, is a movement towards uh, living out the United Church's Apology to Indigenous Peoples, um, which was in 1986, and the Apology of former, resident, former Students of United Church Indian Residential Schools and their families and communities um, in 1998. Um, the Healing Fund is made possible by gifts to missions and service uh, with the United Church. So some of the projects that have been funded, um, so uh, communities have access to the Healing Fund through our website. We'll share the link um, and information later on. Um, but communities have access to uh, up to, to $15,000 to um, implement and bring um, projects, healing projects that would restore men and bring back language, culture, um, any kind of memorial commemorations to residential school survivors. Um, so some of these projects will look like as like healing circles, sharing circles, um, where you bring in an elders to share their stories and experiences. Um, you know, sometimes they could be really heavy, but they like to, um, most of the communities um, incorporate other programs along with um, these sharing circles. So they could be uh, learning how to cook in a kitchen, doing some crafts, doing some traditional crafts, or being out on the land, or even through ceremony. So it's not just the sitting, sitting around and talking and sharing those, because those could be really heavy. So when you incorporate different cultural activities and language learning and you bring in families and you bring in the youth there's that intergenerational bridging and sharing stories with each other and that too that the, in sharing food all of that together helps with healing um, because you know you can't just keep everything bottled up you have to be able to share your story um, a lot of the projects, we encourage uh, our applicants to have uh, trauma-informed practices in place uh, to support those um, that may need um, additional um, supports um, if anything was triggering through any programs. Um, so those are the healing circles and uh, sharing circles. Uh, there's residential school reunions um, where people could, where they could come together and have their own healing circles together. 
There's workshops, trainings for elders, resource people, counselors for uh, for counselors and parents um, to talk about um, ways they could heal together as a community, as a school environment. There's a lot of a lot a lot a lot of language and culture recovery programs, um, communities that's wanting to do these programs. Um, in the last round, um, which was just this fall, um, I would have to say at least seventy percent of our applicants that were approved were language initiatives. Um, so a lot of the other programs that involve culture are beating. Um, learning how to harvest and hunt and pick berries, um, understanding those cycles of life as well of animals and the plants and having that connection, what, what we call our first family. Our first family is um, Mother Earth because that's where, that's where we come from. Um, our spirit comes from uh, Mother Earth. So that's that, that's that connection um, of being out on the land. Um, so being out on the land is healing in, in, in itself. Um, traditional cultural events, um, there's been uh, powwows, um, sun dances, rain dances, um, different sacred fires um, that would have these commemorations and honoring residential school survivors. Um, so the, the events could vary from something that's very um, artsy um, involving dancing and singing um, to something that's very spiritual. Um, there's a lot of other events um, that involve the bridging between the, the, the church and cultural events as well. Um, really, really high emphasis on um, youth programmings and children. And I'll talk about a little bit of the children and, and family programs with the UCW stuff as well. But there's a, you know, if there's a lot of youth led programs, um, because it's, it's very important to involve our youth and it's very important for the youth to know their history of uh, their grandparents or their great grandparents, or even their parents of where they come from in terms of their, their, their story. Um, there's also been um, projects of collecting and publishing stories, books, newsletters um, around people's stories of residential school or even language. Um, one of the projects that was supported um, a couple of years ago was a young Indigenous youth. Um, she was Afro-Indigenous or she is Afro-Indigenous and Cree. So her indigenous side was Cree from Saskatchewan, and she created a children's book that talks about dad's experience at residential school and um, the things that he was teaching his daughter. Um, I could, if anybody's interested in that and what that book is, I could reference that later on as well. Um, but that book was published um, and that was fully funded by the, the healing fund. So uh, she was able to um, get assistance and support for a translator. She was also able to support the artists who drew the graphics for her, for her book. Um, so, and there's also healing for um, young people and two-spirit people, like I said, the youth. Um, so, as I mentioned in the beginning, gifts through missions and service um, is where the where if like if you're interested in gifting to the healing fund, that's where it goes is through mission and service. Um, through the so, sorry, I'm a little stumbled. Um, I've started with the healing fund in 2022, so I don't have the full scope and history of how much projects have been funded since this since the healing fund um started. Um, but the, the information sheet that I do have, it goes back to 2012. And I could say that since then, there's been about 300 projects that's been supported by the generous gifts, uh, made to the healing fund, uh, through mission and service. So that was since 2012. And if the healing fund started in 1994, um, there's well over 300 projects that have been supporting Indigenous peoples and communities and healing from the, the impacts of residential school. Um, for 2023, 
Um, there were tw 22 um, initiatives that were funded. And this year in 2024, um, we were able to support 24 healing fund initiatives. Some of the projects that have been supported by the healing fund, the Salgeen Wesley United Church has the Ojibwe and Win Kano Mage Win through immersion. So that is an Ojibwe and an Kinomage, Kinomage is like teaching. Um, so it's a, an Ojibwe language course that was fully immersed. And when you attend the program, um, it was uh, intergenerational. So they had a lot of young people and young families coming there to sit with their language speakers from their community. They learned language through games and they learned language through food. And that was a program that went on for approximately six months. The no the Minogin Gitaga Society, which is the um which is in London, Ontario, had the Orange Flower Memorial Project. So what they did is they built a memorial garden filled with orange flowers. And that was to um honor those residential those those that didn't make it home and the survivors that are here with us today. The Regina Native Outreach Ministry. Um, which was a project that was supported by the UCW, and I'll exp I'll still explain how the UCW stuff works in a little bit. The Regina Native Outreach Ministry had the mother and baby welcome bags. So through that, they were able to do four distributions of um, baby bags for boys, girls, and um, like and a unisex bag. And they had information for... Um, Ministry support, traditional support, the bags came with um, any of the basic needs that mom needs for those first, the first couple of days and weeks for baby, um, you know, just to kind of help her um, and help, the, help them um, for their first couple of days at home, um, included feedings, included clothes, a blanket. And one of the uh, really cool things that I liked about the um a connection that was made was a UCW group in the East Coast um wanted to contribute to the baby welcome bags and the church in the East Coast they had a knitting or um some kind of quilting program where they made um shawls but they also could have been used as blankets so what they end up doing was they end up shipping those um, shawls uh, to be used as baby blankets um, to be added to those welcome bags. So it was really nice to see um, a, a, a UCW um, from the East Coast be able to connect and support the Regina Native Outreach Ministries in the, in the mother and baby welcome bags. Another program um, that was supported was the Giga Doa No Um, Sorry, I'm have I'm I don't know how to totally speak it, but a lot of our programs are within the language. Um, ina Ina Hona Gowin, which means something doing something in a good way. So this program is here in Northern Ontario. Um, there it's a it's a grandmother's group out of uh, Ganabajing, which is a Serpent River First Nation, um, which is between Espanola and Sault Ste. Marie. And because there's a, lot, a couple of communities within the North Shore, um, and they're smaller communities, the closest cities would either be Sault Ste. Marie or Sudbury. And a lot of the people um, from Ganabajing would they, they they tend to go to the cities for more support, um, either for education or jobs and things like that. But they tend to find themselves getting lost um, in terms of getting the proper supports and services that are needed. And um, it results in a lot of our people um, having struggles um, either with housing, food security, uh, or even becoming houseless. Um, so the grandmother's group in Gnabajing, um, they go out there and provide uh, food um, to the indigenous homeless um, population. 
Um, one of their events, they had over 160 um, people coming out where they were able to provide hot soups and suppers and um, give out some warm clothing and offer a fire um, for the for, for a weekend. Um, the last one other project is a which I think this one is really unique as well is the horse spirit healing and wellness. Um, they were able to provide met first uh, mental health first aid training and other um, aftercare workshops for elders in Saskatchewan. So one of their main goals is be um, things they identified was that grandparents are raising their grandchildren, but they don't have the the knowledge um, on how to su better support their grandchildren, whether if it's through like the uh, supporting with mental health or even the basic first aid. So this program, um, they bring in professionals to train um, the grandparents on some of the stuff that would help them with their grandchildren. And through that as well, it gives them the opportunity to um, share their stories and experiences as well and how to support each other as grandparents, but also um, in raising their, their grandchildren, their, all their, their grandchildren together. So I felt that was a very interesting program that was uh, funded uh, earlier this year. Um, in terms of the UCW, um, so the National UCW, which is the uh, United uh, Church, what is it again? Sorry, um, United Church United Church Women Group. Um, every five years, they um, select a project and they gift to that project for five years. And in two thousand and twenty three, they have cho no two thousand and twenty two. Late 2022, they chosen uh, the Healing Fund as their five-year focus. So UCWs across the country um, gift their um, their gift their gifts <laughs> to the Healing Fund, and their main um, objective is supporting women um, and their families. So how that works is. Um, the healing fund itself, we have 150,000 um, to gift to healing fund initiatives. And with the gifts from UCW, um, we add to that. So whatever gifts that come in throughout the year, um, it'll allow us to fund one extra project in the springtime that focus on women and families. And because, um, there's a lot of single dads as well um, that need the support. So as long as the, 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 if, if there's a program that is focused on single dads as well, as long as the program is supporting the children, um, we're able to select if the, the committee itself, the working group could select that program as well um, because they're the, 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 the need is with the children. Um, so this year, the oh no sorry last year as I mentioned they supported the um, Regina Native Outreach Ministries with the baby um, bag um, mom and baby bag program this year uh, for 2024 the working group has selected uh, cooking in the or healing in the kitchen up in uh, Northern, I forget where they're at, BC or Northwest Territories. Sorry, uh, Fort McKay First Nation, Métis Nation. Um, I believe it's Northern Alberta. Um, so they have a healing in the kitchen um, that's bringing together families to connect with the elders and learning how to cook traditional foods and as well as integrating language into their program too. So healing in the kitchen um, is running for, they were, we supported them in the springtime, so it'll be running for the year. Um, and then in, this, in spring 2025, the working group will select a new project um, to focus on um, for the National UCW. So members from the National UCW, um, they're encouraged to give to the Healing Fund. And gifts could be sent to um, 
through missions and service and then you just got to do the the healing fund there's a there's a little code that um you can email the healing fund for the code on how to um direct your gifts specifically for a ucw focus project or you could just memo line um the healing fund and that'll go to the general um uh, for healing fund initiatives um yeah so if you're interested in the healing fund, um, sorry, I'm trying, I'm losing my windows here. Um, if you're interested in connecting with the healing fund, uh, you can email myself at healing at unitedchurch.ca. Also, gifts could be sent through by visiting um, a link that I'll post here momentarily. And I'll also post the webpage for um, the, the on where to get information for the healing fund. So you're welcome to, if you have any questions in regards to the healing fund, um, processes, procedures, applications, criteria, um, I'd be more than willing to connect with you and share the information with you. If you're more, if you're also interested into learning more about the National UCW um, projects that support it, um, I'll be willing to uh, share that information with you as well. Um, Oh, yeah, thank you. And um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, ah, I'm Sarah Stratton, and I work in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit as Reconciliation and Indigenous Justice Animator. This is my cat, Steve who always likes to join me. Uh, I thought he wouldn't do that tonight, but I was wrong. Um, just give everybody just a couple of seconds to maybe um, just absorb, um, just absorb what um, Joni has shared with us. It's such a huge, excuse me a second. It's such a huge range of, um, of indigenous led work. Um, in response to in response to um, the call for uh, reconciliation and and healing and that fund I don't know if Joni mentioned it I think the United Church Fund has been going since 1994 so just amplify all of those amazing examples that she gave you um, uh, and think about the the type of work that has been done for for 30 years now in the in the in the church um, so thanks to Joni for sharing that. I want to just give you a few minutes to to let that settle. Um, I am going to talk about the reparations framework uh, in a minute. Um, this, of course, relates to unmarked burial sites. And uh, but before I did that, I thought I would just give you a little update on our own initiative about that. When when um, the truth of unmarked graves was was revealed and, and accepted in the summer of 2021. Um, we spent some time in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit um, figuring out um, what would be the appropriate way to respond. And uh, the appropriate way we were, we, were, um, we were led to understand was not to rush in, um, but to listen to community and see what community wanted to take time to pray and reflect. Um, and so we did that, but then we did come up with a, an initiative called Bringing the Children Home, which is a it's a responsive program. It's not a program that we go out and talk about a lot, but we contacted the communities who were the closest or who were the caretaker communities for residential institutions operated by the United Church and began a series of conversations. The moderator, past moderator, current moderator, and the general secretary have been in conversation with about eight communities um, so far, we have funded um, four community-led projects to commemorate uh, the children who were lost from those communities. Uh, we're in discussion with two more. Um, we've also undertaken a huge archival project to digitize new materials that were not identified by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, including records from hospitals or missions or communities of faith. Um, and we are actively sharing that with communities who, who want them. Um, and that has been probably the most important part of the Bringing the Children Home program. Um, we have shared 
uh, those documents now with 24 communities. And that represents about 75,000 pages of material, um, thousands of images. Um, and, and more coming on all the time. So that's just, we have had questions recently about what's going on with the bringing the children home. That's just a little sketch of it for you. So you, you have some idea of, um, you have some idea of, uh, of what's um, happening in there. But what I wanted to talk to you about uh, tonight um, is, um, an experience I had at the end of last month, which was to attend the final national gathering of the Special Interlocutor for Missing and Disappeared Children and Unmarked Burials, um, and to receive um, her final report. So Kimberly Murray was appointed to this position in June of 2022, and she and her staff have functioned uh, independently and impartially since in a nonpartisan and transparent manner. They've been in discussion with government, with churches, with First Nations groups, um, governance groups and cultural groups, um, and, uh, and with the churches. Um, and her mandate was to identify the needed measures and to make recommendations for a new federal legal system that would deal with um, unmarked graves and burial sites of children at former Indian residential res schools um, in a respectful and culturally appropriate way. Um, so that has been what her work has been for the last two and a half years. I think I mentioned there were seven of those gatherings and the United Church um, was present at all of them except one. Um, that work has now concluded and um, the special interlocutor has released her final report, um, which is called an indigenous led framework for reparations. And that was on October 29th in Quebec. Notably, as you can see in the title slide here, um, she is now referred to as the special interlocutor on missing and disappeared children and burial sites. Disappeared was not originally in her title. That's a really significant change as we're gonna discuss later in the presentation. And we'll just move to the next slide. But before we go any further, I want to offer a few um, thoughts on the idea of, of reparations. The American ethicist, uh, Margaret Urban Walker, defines what can be a very complex um, concept as amends owed for wrongs and wrongful harms. And when we talk about reparations in the Christian context, we often turn to the Old Testament vision of Jubilee outlined in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In both of those texts, reparation is made for gaining wealth at the expense of others, either through enslavement or the um, displacement from, from one's land. In the New Testament, we see it reflected in stories like the story of Zacchaeus. Um, that's often cited as a story of reparative justice. The dishonest tax collector pledges to share his wealth back with the people whom he has defrauded. Now, we all know there's no real evidence that a Jubilee ever existed, um, but, and that's often used to kind of um, discredit the idea. Um, but even if there never was a Jubilee, I think what's interesting is that the original texts and the repetitions of, of those principles uh, in the gospels uh, tell us that it was a really powerful and liberating force within Judeo-Christian thought and teaching. And so it's an important concept in our, in our, um, in our story. And we have historical examples of reparations. Reparations were paid to formerly enslaved people by Quakers in the 17th century. Uh, during the American Civil War, some slave holders were paid what I would call a perverse form of reparation when they freed the enslaved. In our own or our parents' lifetimes, Germany paid reparations for the Holocaust. So did Canada and the United States for World War II internment of Japanese um, people of Japanese descent. And with the exception of reparations for slaveholders, I'm not passing any judgment on the quality of those reparations. That judgment belongs to the people who received the reparation. And so it's appropriate, I think, that as the United Church of Canada, which has committed wrongs and wrongful harms against Indigenous peoples, 
it's appropriate that we pay attention to what the special interlocutor is putting forward as an indigenous framework for reparation. And we can move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a picture from the gathering. It was rooted in the voices and experience of survivors. It was a place of reflection. It was a place of trauma, community, humor, cultural expression, healing, and looking towards the future. As a non-Indigenous representative of one of the churches, it was an honor for me to be present and to be welcomed there. And I want to take time now to acknowledge that this presentation contains material that will be traumatic for Indigenous people. And if that is you, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself, whether that's step away, whatever it is. I also want to acknowledge that there's a lot of technical and legal language in this presentation, but to ask you to remember that behind all of that, there are real children, real families, and real communities who have suffered at the hands of the state and the churches. So we can, we can move on. These, uh, these sentences are from the introduction to the report. Uh, the special interlocutor is very clear that she does not make recommendations. She is naming what she calls the legal, moral, and ethical obligations of the churches, government, and other institutions. Legal, moral, and ethical obligations. And the framework is built on human rights instruments, indigenous law, international human rights and criminal law, and Canadian constitutional law. I can see some people making notes. If you're interested, we can make a PDF of this available to you so you don't have to scramble to get everybody's, uh, everyone get their notes down. You can just listen. Um, next slide, please. There was another key important, uh, key part of the report and the context in which it was created, and that is the obligation to survivors. The special interlocutor is very, very clear on the obligation we owe them. And also clearly running through the report is the fact that the residential school system was unequivocally genocidal. These are accepted as facts in the, in the report. Next slide. It's a report. It covers many issues in addition to those that I'm gonna talk about uh, tonight. Uh, those include um, provide, continuing to provide space and funding for elders to gather and speak, um, resilience-based healing and health care, so things like some of the stuff Joni was talking about, rematriation of burial land, and repatriation of the children themselves. Next slide. I'm going to focus on these five focal points. Um, these are findings and obligations of importance to the United Church because they redefine the nature and impact of residential and other colonial institutions. They name how Canada as a state continues to deny its role. They name a possible way forward. Um, they address Canadian society's denialism of its role. And they also name specific actions the church must undertake as part of their own obligations. So we'll go to the next slide. The first we'll talk about is, is enforced disappearances. And we can move forward once more. So probably the biggest finding of this report is that many children who did not return home must be considered to have been intentionally disappeared. They're not missing. They were intentionally disappeared. We know from the findings of both the TRC and the special interlocutor that it was anticipated by the government and churches that children would die. They designed residential institutions with cemeteries attached. Little was done to prevent or mitigate that. That children were shuttled between institutions and that they were dehumanized after death. These are all practices that are associated with the international uh, understanding of enforced disappearance. And as those of you with any experience in international human rights work know, to be disappeared is a very specific and serious form of a human rights violation. So we'll go to the next slide. 
as I said, it's different to being characterized as missing and holds a distinct place in, in law. Enforced disappearance uh, involves deprivation of liberty by the state and the concealment or refusal to acknowledge what happened to the person. The harm extends beyond the person to their family and community and is considered in law to be ongoing. And enforced disappearance is a crime against humanity or a damage to all of us if it is part of a widespread or systemic attack on any civilian population. And these characters all apply to what happened in residential institutions. Next slide. So the report, again, it was about obligations. The report names two obligations to deal with this. The first is to pay full reparations uh, to living descendants for disappeared children. So that's a part of where it's an ongoing arm, right? And it says that government must uh, publicly acknowledge um, that it conducted enforced disappearances. So these are two ethical and legal obligations. Uh, and they are obligations that the United Church could choose to support through education and advocacy as a um, as a natural follow up to the work that we have that we have done on reconciliation. Um, now we're going to move to the next slide where we're going to talk about settler amnesty and the culture of impunity. Uh, move straight along. So connected to connected to Canada having a policy of disappearing children is Canada also having um, a culture of impunity or um, what what the special interlocutor calls a settler amnesty. She says settler amnesty is an ongoing and unconditional refusal to prosecute those who are most responsible for the harm. Impunity is the freedom from facing any punishment and a culture of impunity permits individuals and institutions to keep on doing harm, knowing that they will not be held accountable. So at the time it ran residential institutions all the way through to the present, even with the context of the TRC, she argues that Canada has fostered um, a culture of impunity and a um, and a settler amnesty. We could go to the next um, slide. How have they done it? Um, the historian Sean Carlton um, says that Canada has bubble wrapped itself in terms of denying that it has forcibly disappeared children. And how did it do that? It did that by um, abstaining from references to cultural genocide and other forms of genocide in international law and Canadian law, refusing to sign certain conventions, and removing crucial references to specific acts of genocide from the Canadian legal definition of genocide. So she argues, the special interlocutor argues, that this was a deliberate um, um, alignment of international and uh, Canadian law uh, to protect itself from charges that could arise from the residential institution system. She says this amnesty is self-granted. The government gave itself amnesty. It's blanket, it covers everybody. It's unconditional. Nobody had to, nobody had to participate in any form of accountability, for example, such as um, perpetrators had to do in South Africa in their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it's de facto, it's just assumed. It's not ever announced, it's just assumed. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that she has named obligations that Canada has to, to deal with this settler amnesty and culture of impunity. Um, in terms of addressing it, Canada has to uh, ratify the American Convention on Human Rights and accept the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, accept the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance, and codify it in Canadian law, and refer enforced disappearances to the International Criminal Court. 
Again, these are obligations that the United Church of Canada could choose to support through education and advocacy. Uh, next slide. This I think was my, my third focal point, a commission of inquiry, and we'll explore it on the next slide. So the special interlocutor has said that in cases of enforced disappearance, international law requires investigation and reparation through an independent commission of inquiry. Um, it can't be conducted by the state itself. Uh, and in this case, it should be indigenous led and would have, would have powers under international law that both the TRC and the special interlocutor herself purposely weren't given. If we look at the next slide. We will see that the obligation is, of course, to call for such a commission um, and that it would be an independent, indigenous led national commission. Now, the United Church of Canada, I think, could respond in two ways to this, could support the call through its education and advocacy, and it could um, participate fully and transparently in the commission as, as, um, as required. The next point is uh, settler denialism. See, now Brian just knows he has to advance the slide for me. He just hears me say the next point, and there it is. Settler denialism. The special interlocutor focus, focuses significantly on settler denialism, um, which, which is an act that undermines the call for reconciliation and for justice. She highlights five common myths that are um, broadly shared by a relatively small number of highly influential people in media, education, business, politics, and in faith communities. And these myths, these common tropes of denialism are that, oh, the harms of residential institutions have been overstated and the positives have been overlooked. The experiences at residential schools have been exaggerated. We don't really know the truth about the deaths at residential schools. And there's a conspiracy to exaggerate deaths for political and financial gain on the part of indigenous communities. And the final one, it's not genocide. So these, these myths are, are repeated um, regularly in social media, in mainstream media, in, in um, community gatherings, um, and the relatively small number of people who do this have significant power to reach a lot of people. And the myths are often presented sort of as a curiosity. I can't believe that's true, you know, it's it's like a it's a questioning um, for clarification. Uh, I mentioned Sean Carlton earlier, and he says uh, he characterizes it as a learned behavior um, that when people feel implicated by the horrific evidence in front of them, um, th they seek comfort in denying reality. Who wants to admit that that this has happened in this country? Um, and in fact, there was um, there was a speaker at the event. Um, I forget his name now, but he he's a former diplomat um, for Canada, and um, and he said, and he 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 runs um, an initiative, a uh, solidarity initiative with Indigenous peoples around this issue, and he said uh, he was very clear about he's worked for Canada his entire life. He said, I love Canada. And it breaks my heart that I re when I realize what Canada has done. But I have to confront that. I have to confront the fact that it did it. It doesn't matter that my heart hurts. And he, he's a very powerful speaker. I'll, I'll try and find some more of his, uh, of his address. So what are the obligations around settler denialism? Next slide. Um. 
she's proposed a number of legislative and legal steps that Canada can undertake to address denialism, including addressing it as hate speech and particularly targeting online media. Uh, there is actually a private member's bill to add um, residential institution denialism to the criminal code as hatred of Indigenous peoples. That's from the uh, MP Leah Gazan. Um, she can't move it forward anymore in this session, but um, she is interested in talking to the government about asking them to pick it up and carry it forward. That is certainly something that the United Church could get behind in terms of uh, political advocacy. Next slide. This is really super, super detailed, but again, it shows you how, how she has thought through the obligations. Um, she has a very detailed plan, including tracking, monitoring, enforcing penalties um, around residential school denialism. And she calls for support for the communities that are affected by this hate. It's not just about stopping the dissemination of hate. It's also about um, helping to stop the harm in community. Again, it does link back to some of what Joni was talking about in the, in the range of programs that the Healing Fund offers. Now, how can the United how can the United Church um, respond to this? Well, we are a faith based organization that says its goal is to be anti racist, actively anti racist. So I think the church has a contribution to make not only in supporting the legislation, but also in everything we do um, as a community of communities of faith, education, advocacy, faith reflection, how we talk about this on Sunday mornings, how we talk about it um, in events like this um, and what we're willing to do to, to stand up for it. Um, the next slide. This takes us to the 10 obligations in which the churches are specifically named or implicated. So I think, as you can tell, I think we're implicated in all the others and we have something to contribute to them, but we should really in particular look at, at what we have been asked to do. Um, so let's go to uh, the next slide. So we have two obligations around the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Um, and those concern calls to actions 71 to 76. Those are the calls to action that relate to unknown burial sites. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about bringing the children home, national and regional archive staff continue to do the work that we're called on here um, to identify and share all the information that the church holds on deaths, burials, and cemeteries related to United Church residential institutions, as well as hospitals and missions. So we need to continue to do that, to do that work if we're going to respond positively to this report. The next slide, please. Uh, this calls for continued funding for community-led um, investigations into missing and disappeared children, as well as um, commemoration. Um, and this will definitely have implications for the United Church. Um, I gave you a quick update on bringing the children home. Um, there is no timeline to wrap that up, um, but this definitely has implications for, for the future of that, of that program. Uh, the next one also has uh, implications for uh, bringing the children home. Um, and there was an entire hearing that was about this question. Who should have access to, who should have ownership of all of the documentation that we have related to these children in residential institutions? And the special interlocutor calls for indigenous peoples to have sovereignty over all the information that is held by them, uh, about them, all the information about them that is held by Canada and by the churches and other institutions. This includes searching for all records, transferring them, and following certain human rights-based archival principles. It's really sounds, it sounds boring, but in some cases, this is the only record we have of someone's life. And, and how do we honor that? How do we honor that record? So 
uh, our regional and national archives have been proactively searching and digitizing all this information, as I mentioned, that wasn't previously identified by the TRC, and we are providing that to communities uh, in digital form. And the archives reconciliation framework already identify, already follows the path that's laid out here, um, including the um, the uh, Joanne Orlent Orlent Liker principles, which are principles related to uh, the right to know the truth with respect to human rights abuses. Um, but archive says we have had that training, but we we need to maybe we have got new staff. We need to do more training on it. And they have also been trained in the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and provision, or OCAP. Now, one of the things you might have heard coming out of the Special Interlocutor's report, news coverage, if you heard anything, um, is her criticism of the churches for withholding records. And not all churches are the same. Not all Indigenous people are the same. Um and um, I don't think this is, uh, I think when she says the church is, she's expressing her frustration. Um, she's expressing her frustration with somebody other than the United Church of Canada. In her report, she actually highlights the innovative work that our archives have done to proactively search out more records and share the records with the community. That's not to say we deserve a pat on the back. We still held all those documents for a long time. But I just want you to know that um, she has expressed appreciation for the way we have been doing that work. And I think would like to see us continuing to do that work, continuing to to share that material um, with the people uh, whom it concerns. Um, so, uh, I think that's an important thing for you to note. And I think it's also important that those institutions that are not, um, releasing their documents, I think it's important that they are pressured to do so. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. Um, this obligation is about passing legislation to create a national records registry so that there would be a national registry where everyone's records are listed out and you know exactly where they are and exactly where you can go to get them. Um, the United Church could obviously support that legislation and, and it could comply with it once it's passed. Um, let's just go to the next slide. Again, this is still on the right to truth legislation. One of the things that um, she calls for is creating an offense for destroying or altering records. Um, and um, this, this should be obvious that you don't do that. And it is in fact, the United Church's archival principle uh, is to preserve. Um, that, is, that is clear, but we do need to seek some clarity on this one um, because we are currently, um, by Supreme Court decision in 2017 called Fontaine, we are currently legally obliged to destroy our copies of um, survivors' claims of, um, of uh, more serious abuse, sexual, physical, psychological abuse, uh, through the alternative dispute resolution process or the independent assessment process. These are deeply, deeply personal and traumatic uh, testimonies um, that when people gave them, um, they were not asked to consent for them to go to archives. So the legal decision is that they have to be destroyed. And that means that those of us who hold copies of them, once the files are closed, we have been ordered to destroy them. But now the special interlocutor is is making this call and so i think we just have to do this carefully we have to do it we have to do it the right way it, it, again it all comes down to the fact that this is someone else's story not ours and 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 so i think this is something that we will be um trying to get more more guidance on um and if we go to the next slide you'll see that she's also 
saying we need a moratorium on destroying anything. And so that could also apply to these records. And again, we need to get more clarity on that. Um, this is not to say we agree or disagree with this. It's about the reality is, is that we are in a certain legal space that we need to be clearer on. Okay, almost there now. Just a couple of more slides. Um, the next one, return of records. I'm sure you've heard lots of stories about there's all kinds of records in the Vatican or there's all kinds of records in uh, the archives of the Church of England, um, and, and we need to get those. I think this is mostly directed to Roman Catholic and Anglican entities, but I think that the United Church needs to maybe take a look at um, Methodist records in England to see if, if is there anything there um, that relates to the Methodist missions um, uh, pre-1925. So we need to take a look at that. Um, and the final, not the final slide, but the final obligation is the next one. Apology and action is reparation. Again, um, this is probably not a surprise. We are being, we are being told um, that, you know, the apology that you did in 1986, the apology that you did in 1998, those were steps, but they are not. They are not the uh, substantive, um, detailed um, apologies for the level of harm that you've caused. And, and you do need to revise or, or reissue uh, more meaningful apologies. Um, we already have um, a couple of requests for this in front of us that we are, that we are trying to work through. Um, and that is certainly a priority for the United Church uh, to, in, in light of of the um, what became clear in 2021, where we need to go in terms of an apology. Also outstanding is the fact that the 1986 apology, that still hasn't been accepted. And it hasn't been accepted because people need to know that we're truly living into it. So so all of this work around the apologies, I think, will be will be a big one uh, for the church uh, moving forward, uh, as well as you know the larger question of of reparative justice. Uh, one more slide. So uh, this is the logo of the of the special interlocutor and. Um, And I think it's a beautiful representation of a, of a mother and a child. And you, you sort of see the negative space of the small bear. Um, and, you, and you know what that, that means, that child, is, that child is gone. So I, I reflect back on my experience um, a week and a half ago. Um, and I think back to the opening session where an elder said, right at the beginning, every one of you in this room has the story of a child that didn't come home. And I suspect strongly that the elder didn't have um, a church or a government representative in mind when he said that. But I couldn't help but think at the time that it applied to me as well, as well as those that he intended, although in a different way. And that just kind of sat with me in the morning. And then it went to this very powerful, powerful presentation of the report and, and other sessions. And I recognized that it is true. As, as the representative of the non-Indigenous United Church of Canada, I do, in fact, hold stories of children who didn't come home. They're not my children. I don't know those children, but I hold their stories because I hold the institutional history. And... Consequently, that I do have, we do have as a church, sacred obligations to those children. And I, I think it's very appropriate that the special interlocutor named these as sacred obligations. Her report builds significantly on what the TRC brought forward into non-Indigenous people's consciousness. It offers a clear and concrete path towards justice. I believe, though, that it's going to be an uphill battle with the government 
and with settler Canada. But I believe it's a hill we need to climb as church and as society. Much as the late Honorable Marie Sinclair indicated nine years ago, almost nine years ago when he released the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have described for you a mountain. We have shown you the path to the top and we call on you to do the climbing. So here's more of the path uh, to the top and the climbing. So I'll end it there and um, thank you for your attention and time. Thank you to Joni and Sarah for your sharing and for your very profound presentations. Uh, now is a time um, uh, for questions and answers. If people have questions, you're invited to send them by email. Um, so Sarah and Joni, um, there is a question for you um, if you're both able to respond. Um, I'll pose a question and then just leave a bit of time for pause for you both to reflect and also for everyone just to reflect on all that Sarah has shared. There was um, a, a lot of a lot of profound information. So I'll pose a question. Um, you can pause and then you're welcome to respond as you would like. Um, so given all that has been shared this evening um, around the Healing Fund, uh, around the Indigenous-led framework, um, what are some very practical ways that people in local communities of faith can respond to what has been shared and presented this evening? Over to you. Well, as the um, in terms of the healing fund and the pro, well, um, inside the healing fund, I, I I must say that there are other grants that are available, um, for uh, post sec indigenous post secondary school students and indigenous ministers, um, and and to the indigenous church. So there's also the Dorothy Jenkins Fund, the Alvin Dixon Fund, and the Wasiabin Indigenous um bursary for post secondary school students. So aside from, so there's, yeah, so there's the, the four grants in general, and then the support to the UCW project. Um, what you could do in your local communities of faith is share the information of the Healing Fund. If you have Indigenous community members that access your 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 community, you could share the grant information with them as well. Um, but you also, you know, if, 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 um, there's that opportunity um, in collections, you know, um, where your, your community of faith could make a, a gift to the healing fund um, and it could go to either one of the post-secondaries or you could specify it to the UCW, uh, to a UCW initiative. Um, that's how uh, you, could, you could just share the word, spread the word of the healing fund um, and that it, it's intended to support indigenous peoples and communities and the healing, um, you know, from the, from the impacts of residential school. So it's restoring languages and cultural programs in communities. Miigwech. Yeah, I, I think that that's always uh, an important contribution to make. Um, I think in light of the special interlocutors report, I think it's, and, and in light of the way we see discourse happening in this country, um, I think it's really important for people to stand up and speak the truth. So if you hear someone saying, I don't really believe those children are buried there, or I don't really believe it was that bad at residential institutions, challenge them say, you know, no, we have this evidence. We have we have the testimony of people who attended. Um, we have these two major investigations now that tell you this truth. It is the truth. So so really push back at push back at those curious questions or the just for clarification questions, because they they are a form of of denialism. So I think that that's a really important thing for people to do. I think it's really important for those of us who are um, settlers to know our history. Um, um, 
Adele and I have been involved in a project about just that, about researching our family histories to see our place in colonialism so that we can understand the role that we played. Um, it's not just that anonymous um, uh, people came here and did terrible things to indigenous people. Those were our relatives and we have continued to um, to to benefit from them. I mean, Adele and I in very different ways. I'm pure English settler background. Adele comes through a different context of also of the history of enslavement. So it's more, it's a different story, but we still both benefit from that. So to actually understand that and, and just own it for what it is, I think being honest with ourselves and being honest with our friends is a really, really important thing that we need to do. Um, if that if that bill around hate crime goes forward, mobilize to get people in favor of it. Talk to your MPs, um, get that bill passed. Um, learn more about reparative justice or reparations. We're going to be doing more work on that in the United Church. Take part in that church in that work when we offer study sessions, when we offer action opportunities. Um, so I think those are those are sort of three big things that you could that you could think about doing, uh, as well as it, uh, supporting supporting the work that Joni has described. Excellent. Thank you both, Joni and Sarah, for sharing these words of um, words of uh, for concrete action. Um, Sarah, a question has just come in for you. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to respond to this one. Okay. So the question is, the additional records that the special interlocutor has asked to be turned or returned, is she envisioning that they would become part of the records at the National Center for Truth and Recon the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, or is another place planned? I think both. Um, uh Everything that we uncover, we send to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. So it started with all of our records that were scanned by the. Sorry, Sarah, you be, you became muted. <laughs> yes. We think you're back now. Yep, you're back now. Welcome back. <laughs> we sh no. It's breaking up. Hear me now? Yes, okay. we can hear you now. <laughs> Something wrong with my, my headset. Um, everything that we sent to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, we um, sent to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Everything that we um, have found since um, in a new, broader search also goes to the NCTR. So, but... The NCTR does have um, privacy issues uh, because it's housed within a university. It has um, some issues about how it can share material because of privacy law. And so it can be very difficult for people to find the records from the NCTR. So while I think she wants those records there, she also wants them accessible in other ways. And so that's why, that's why she wants this national registry so that you're not dependent on having to go to the NCTR, which is encumbered by federal legislation. You can just go to this other thing and say, oh, the United Church has all these records. I'll just go there and get them because we're not encumbered by them. We can share them. So um, I think she wants probably both. Uh, but I think she has expressed concern about some church parties saying, oh, all our records at the NC are at the NCTR. You can just go there and find them. We know that that doesn't work for people because because of the privacy legislation that that encumbers that institution. So they're trying to they're trying to fix that very very hard because they are they are the survivors' archives, right? But um, we need to do both. Is the is the answer? Excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and now a question for both of you. Uh, so in addition to what you have already shared this evening, uh, what else might you offer as either encouragement or challenge to people who are here? And this may be 
maybe these are some of your closing words uh, to everyone here. Well, I myself like to encourage everyone to um, attend any kind of Indigenous events happening in your area. You know, attend your local friendship center. Attend a, 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 a date, maybe if there's an Indigenous health center there, you know, learn about, you know, you might want to, you know, you might learn a little bit about the medicines and how there's that connection to the land. Um. You know, a lot of the, like, aside from sun dances and, like, you know, the, the ceremonies, um, some of those are private, you know, um, invitational. Um, but powwows, art markets, um, fashion shows, you know, all of those show the culture, you know. Um, some of them, you know, make, uh, do fashion out of deer hides and porcupine quills. And, you know, my mom makes porcupine quill earrings and jewelry, you know, it, it went from the traditional art of quill boxes, but my mom, um, she, we, we say she, uh, modernized the, the art of quill work and she's bringing it more into more fashionable dangly earrings and necklaces and bracelets and rings. And, uh, she does excellent work by the way. Um, but yeah, you know, take advantage and take a look at all those craft work, you know, maybe sit in at a, at a, at a beading shop or, uh, you know, learn the importance of a, a ribbon shirt, a ribbon skirt, you know, you're not going to, if, if you, if you're going to go to a sharing circle or you're going to go to an event or there's some kind of, you know, residential school thing, the chances are you're, you're, you're not going to hear those heartfelt, really deep stories. You're going to hear little things here and there, but you're going to see how the connection between elders and youth, the connection between people, you're going to hear a little bit language probably spoken. You know, because it's really hard. Like I myself is not a fluent speaker. I'm gonna try my best as a, a, a when I do the closing prayer in a little bit. Um, but you know, you you'll you'll hear you'll hear a little bit of that. You know, the laughter is healing. You know, you'll you'll hear a lot of laughter in places. The art, the vibrancy. You know, um, it is heavy work, but we're really really we're resilient. We're strong, and you know a lot of that shows you know when you when you hear people talk when you hear the laughter when you see the artwork when you see what's being expressed in the paintings or what's being you know you learn about the richness of a quill box you know what the connection is there between the hard work of harvesting porcupine quills harvesting birch bark you know learning how to work with such delicate material you know, it's it's all in there, and the, and and the stories shared through those makings of craft work. You know, uh, it's, it's I I have lots of stories from my sharing from my grandma and my grand and my and my grand my great grandparents. Um, but the other thing, the other thing I wanted to make mention too is when you see people struggling, mental like their mental health issues or addictions. Understand that is the intergenerational trauma. You know, my parents were, um, what do you, what would you say, weren't able to speak about how they feel. My parents weren't able to, you know, be children, you know, probably because their parents couldn't do it, right? So grandma and grandpa went to residential school. They were told to not do certain things and how to live and do things. Well, you know, that didn't give the chance for my parents to, you know, to, to learn the things they need to learn to, to, to um, make sure I have, you know, I don't know how, if I'm saying it right, but just know those, those traumas, those addictions, the mental health, you know, those are intergenerational effects. You know, because our, our, like I said, our parents um, didn't have the chance to um, have those supports that there is today. You know, um, I, you know, my, I, I, if, if I recall, my mom, you know, uh, you know, she expressed that she didn't have the opportunity to share things that she went through as a child because of her parents and then their grandparents. So, you know, it's just, um, 
having that having that um openness you know it's not just because they're just a bunch of people drinking bottles and you know or they're just going crazy or whatever you know it's it's not that there's deeper there's deeper trauma inside of them that is hard for them to deal with because that's what we were taught to do is not to share how we feel so just understand that mental health is 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 just beyond um it, it, it that's the intergenerational effects from the residential school you got you. yeah i just yeah what she said Friends, thank you for this very profound sharing this evening. Um, there's much to think about and to reflect on. Uh, we are going to move in a moment to close in prayer. Joni is going to lead us in a closing prayer. Um, as we move to close, uh, I'll offer my thanks to Sarah and Joni once again for all that they have shared this evening. Um, I'll, I've put into the chat uh, a link to a survey if you would like to fill that. It's a very short two-minute survey that you can fill in um, at your leisure if you take that link away. So just uh, deep, profound thanks. Uh, an invitation back to Joni to lead us in prayer to close us, ground us as we continue on with our lives beyond. Thank you, Joni. All right, you go ahead. Um, when I was asked to do a closing prayer, um, I like practicing this one because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not fluent in my language, um, but I try my best. And this is one of the things that I like practicing with because it's repetition. Right, like A B C D E F G. You know, you you do you repeat the A B C so many times, you eventually get the hang of it, right? So this is my my, my closing prayer. I will say it in in the Shnabe first, and I'll translate what I just said um right after each other. Um, but yes, Thank you, Creator. Kinage go gaji toing for all that you have created. Miguech mishomis gizis. Thank you, Grandfather Son. Gibwe Gibiwe Jayen Nangwa Nangum for shining on us today. Miguech Nokamis Dibik Jesus. Thank you, Grandmother Son. Grandmother Moon. Gibiwe Gibi We Jayen Nadibikuk for shining on us at night. Miguet Shakamikwe Gimi Jung. Thank you, Mother Earth, for giving us Bamatsuin life. For giving a gimme young medium, for giving us food, gimme young nibish, for giving us water, gimme young wesenyak, for giving us animals. Meanwhile, gimme young nesewen, for giving us breath. Sema nabaganana, giwednang, wabanang, I offer tobacco to the north and the east. Jawanang, meanwhile, epnikishmak, to the south and to the west. Not a motion, Jomoshkabwaya, Minwa, Jejo, Deeya. Help me to stand strong and to have a strong heart. Miigwech, Kujamadado. Thank you, Creator. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed um, our presentation and we'll say Bomompi. Miigwech. <laughs>